Years of Life and Wildfire Harvest I grew up in the embrace of the national movement for the independence and renaissance of Egypt, which used armed struggle at times and was able, over the course of a century until the mid-20th, to restore Egypt's self-awareness after an absence that extended for centuries due to the forces of colonialism and imperialism, starting with the Persians and passing through the Romans, Arabs, Mamluks, and Turks. By the middle of the 20th century, Egypt witnessed a forced political transformation that ostensibly carried some of the slogans of the national movement, even if it denied and denounced them in practice, rather than being an extension of its positive aspects regarding democracy, the system of governance of institutions, and the separation of powers. The demand for freedoms, rights, and the general duty of the Egyptian person in institutionally organized participation became firmly established. To manage the affairs of his community and build its future, it all began for me in 1931 AD. Egypt, in the consciousness of my generation, is a sincere will and determination to advance liberation from colonialism, social justice and the fight against poverty, corruption and protection, social modernization and catching up with European modernity in art, literature, science and material achievements, technology. Egypt is a promising productive force, preserved by a dream based on a past civilizational history and a promising reality, even if its arena is narrowed by the struggle of contradictions and promising visions of the future that befit the status of Egypt. Egypt is the dawn of conscience and ancient civilizational glory. I grew up in a revolutionary civilizational reality that was founded by the struggle of three generations before mine. I first woke up in the light of the West's cannons, and I woke up and rested, calling and stimulating, promising and warning, and I began the project of modernization until I first took the road during the era of the Muhammad Ali, which I mentioned in my books that he was for an occasion, not a reason. Hence Egypt is a new culture. Egypt, the homeland and citizenship, absorbs the heritage with a new critical mind. A culture of awareness of historical subjectivity after successive efforts by the invaders over more than 2,000 years to erase this subjectivity and separate from it. Egypt regained its name and history at the hands of the Azarist Rifei al tadawi it regained its national identity at the hands of Egypt's military peasants, Ahmed Orabi and his companions. I was raised, just as my generation was raised, on the values of freedom, liberation, and change, a culture of tolerance for intellectual sects and religious beliefs. Who wrote, why am I an atheist? Like Adam, or why am I a Muslim? Like Abdul Mutal al Saidi. Those who criticized them criticized them without the criticism spoiling the friendliness of the issue. Egypt was the destination of the Arab intellectuals who thirsted for modernity. The neighborhood was not yet opposing, opposing or competing. Egypt is the word, and Egypt is the action. The Egypt that I lived in and filled my heart and mind witnessed many figures of thought, literature, science, arts, and sports. They were the guiding stars, such as Musharrafa, who was known with Egyptian pride as the peer of Einstein, Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak, Sheikh Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, Sheikh Mohammed Abdo, Taha Hussein, and Salama. Musa, Mukhtar al-Nahad, the great sculptor, Raouf Sarouf, Shibli Shamil, Georgi Zidan, Rose al Youssef, Hoda Sharawi, Mai, Syed Darwish, Daud Hasni, Mohammed Abdul Wahab, and Am Kultham. The names of international athletes shown in swimming, football, and fencing. These and others are shining stars. It guides us to the path and motivates us to follow their example in the name of Egypt and for the sake of Egypt. I was educated in a charity high school, that is, for the poor, but I heard Wagner played for the first time on the screen of the school theater, and I was raised, as my peers were, on books such as The History of Religions in the World, Without Sensitivity or Bias, and cultural magazines such as, My Magazine, Did the Message, and A Culture. The book, The Writer A, The Excerpt A, and The Chapters A. I will never forget an enlightening, satirical weekly magazine, al Bakuka, which was widely circulated, and one of its weekly personalities was the critic Sheikh Bajar, from whose tongue we read sarcastic criticism. For those who disguise themselves in the name of religion. Egypt, which is rich in scientific museums, witnessed a renaissance that accompanied the intellectual and scientific schools. The establishment of Cairo University came about with some struggle and challenge against colonialism. The university included prominent names who contributed a distinguished and historical effort, Shafiq Garbal, Ibrahim Hassan, and Ahmed Amin, in literature and heritage, and Youssef Murad, founder of the School of Science. Integrative Psychology, Mustafa Zayer, founder of the School of Analytical Psychology, Abdul Aziz al in Educational Psychology, and others, and others in Science, Arts and Literature. 
The scientific translation movement linked to the national goal in absorbing the sciences and thought of the era, and using that to build the new Egypt, became active in Egypt. If translation efforts in the modern era began at the hands of Rifei al tadawi and the Al-Alsan school, then it is appropriate to mention with a great deal of pride the Committee for Authorship, Translation and Publishing headed by Ahmed Amin. It presented a wealth of extremely important achievements by the standards of the era, and was a model followed by other Arab societies. How proud I felt when I visited the Authorship, Translation and Publishing Committee in Rabat, Morocco, and its head told me that we are here following the example of Egypt. My ambition, like that of my peers and the people of my generation, was limited to the struggle for a free Egypt, conscious and proud of its history, serious in its quest to build its modern civilizational glory, relying on the hands and minds of its children, and working to produce its modern material and intellectual existence as self-creativity and critical affiliation to the developed world. My ambition was to be like those whose knowledge, culture, and values I imbued myself with, and to contribute positively to building a free-slash-independent-slash-productive Egypt. Despite the many paths, I sought to be positive in my efforts to do so by continuing to think and think without restrictions other than the critical mind, learning about everything new without bias or complexes, and following the thoughts and efforts of those seeking to do so through organizations and parties, and I was able to triumph over the restrictions and warnings of poverty. Relying on myself, but the most dangerous obstacle on the way is the years of intermittent political detention without trial, which totaled 12 years beginning in 1948 AD and ending in 1965 AD. I try to overcome the cruelty and pain of torture in prisons and detention centers, from the military prison to the Abu Zabal prison. Where we lived barefoot, almost naked, struggling to break stones under the weight of the scorching sun, blazing whips, vulgar insults, and insulting insults, and I did not give up my ambition and effort for Egypt, the Egypt of the new mind. I first started writing while I was a university student, in that in my book a series published by Helmi Murad, and the first topic I wrote was in 1953, entitled A Memoirs of a Bad Boy, which is a summary of Charles Darwin's memoirs. But I did not see him because of the arrest. In order to avoid the threads of prohibition and prohibition, I decided to speak in the language of others, while adding my opinion in the introduction and footnotes. From here, I took translation as a means to begin my project Changing the Egyptian Arab Mind, and in 1957 AD two books were published by Dar el Nadim, Interplanetary Travel, which is the first translated scientific book about science and spaceflight, issued on the occasion of launching the dog Laika into space. The second book, Pavlov, His Life and Works, is also the first translated scientific book about this distinguished Russian scientist, to whom I intended to devote my efforts in my graduate studies. Then I stopped writing and translating again for seven years due to political arrests, and despite everything I suffered in the detention centers, I volunteered, and I am politically independent and not involved in any organization, after the defeat of 1967, to take up arms in defense of my country, Egypt, but the political security authorities summoned me, warned me, and demanded that I frankly, you don't stay at home. I continued my effort to speak for others, and I presented a translation of the novel Christ is Crucified Again, written by Nikos Kazatsakis, whose writings I loved and felt a kind of identification with. Translations continued, the quantity of which exceeded 60. I began writing in conjunction with the translation project, and my first book was published in 1990, entitled The End of Marxism. My goal is to criticize Arab culture in the orthodox textual dealing with global thought, taking the frequent talk about the fall of Marxism as an example, with a chapter entitled, Has Liberalism Fallen? I followed this with a book called A Heritage in History, which is a critical vision of cultural errors that are common in our lives and govern us regarding faith, cultural heritage, and understanding history. My third book was published entitled, The American Mind Thinks. From Individual Freedom to the Metamorphosis of Beings, which is an academic study that gives a panorama of the development of the prevailing American mind over a period of 160 years, starting with the Founding Fathers to correct the image of America claimed in our lives and confront the truth, and in it I confirm the dialectical relationship between thought and practical reality origin and development and that thought is the product of social action in a steady dialectical development, citing the development of American thought-slash-action in the fields of philosophy-slash-science-slash-literature and arts, documenting this with texts by American imams of thought. The total number of my books has reached 14 titles, the latest of which is a creative doubt in dialogue with the forefathers. For years, I have been working on issuing a study on the suicide of civilizations, how they fell due to their sons, the first of whom were the clergy, when they had authority rather than reason. That is, for internal reasons first and not only external ones. 
This is in light of what we see today of groups destroying, committing suicide, and massacring those around them in the name of reviving a civilization that disintegrated and fell, and whose memorialization was delayed for centuries. Our pressing issues are many and complementary, and among these issues I have presented in my books. 1. Rebuilding the Egyptian person whom the invaders and tyrannical rulers deliberately alienated from his history and identity. Therefore, there is no integrated dialectical theory for the history of Egypt since ancient times, and it was attempted by Sobi Waida, Dr. Hussein Fazi Sinbad Masri, and Muhammad al Azab. It is necessary to answer the question what happened to the Egyptian person throughout history to make him become in this state of negativity and indifference? So as not to repeat what Al Makrizi and others said, prosperity said, I am going to Egypt, and humiliation said, and I am with you. Then we now live in an era or civilization of the general human being who participates positively, with knowledge and ability, in managing the affairs of his nation, with his responsibility for humanity and the environment in the world. This contradicts the historical circumstances and the life of tyranny and oppression that shaped the Egyptian person and became a social inheritance and influential culture. We should abandon the commitment to achieving what I call the impossible equation. This is the tendency to harmonize or combine the civilization of science and technology, the critical scientific mind, and the fossilized cultural heritage whose era has ended. The first sign of the path to a cultural renaissance is initially evident in the fall of the prestige of the Salaf, Salafist thought, and the worship of the Salaf in the minds of the public, and then the replacement of a culture of change and development by adopting the critical scientific mind. Therefore, we always affirm that there is no renaissance for Egypt except through the renaissance of the Egyptian farmer in the villages and hamlets of the north and south. This farmer is Egypt, who kept carrying on his food a drawing that we sarcastically claim is a bird, which is Horus the protector. 2. In line with this, we need to study the inverse relationship between tyranny and creativity. Tyranny creates a robot whose virtue is obedience without the right to question, and freedom is the creator of man. Freedom, as the philosopher of science Daniel Dennett says, is the motivating force for the creative development of life from its inception until it gradually reached its highest form in the form of the device. Human Nervous System 3. Egyptian intellectuals are first and foremost responsible for the current reality of Egypt. The modern intellectual began as an employee of the ruling authority and was brought up in a culture of obedience, while the enlightened intellectual is the one who maintains a critical distance between himself and those in power. Any religious, political or ideological authority, in order to provide him with the opportunity to have visions in a critical mind that will illuminate the path to the future. 4. I previously mentioned in my book, The Archaeology of the Arab Mind, that the cultural heritage that lived throughout social historical time, even if it took on later religious names, it is the hierarchical heritage in Egypt, a hierarchical heritage with triangular figures, by whose name Egyptians still swear by its name three figures. And this heritage carries the characteristics and characteristics of the Egyptian environment and mentality, and I see it as the legacy of Thoth or Tut, the Lord of Wisdom and the pen in the Egyptian religion, even if it sometimes carried a Greek name, and I see that this heritage governs the prevailing popular culture that has continued for centuries with a state of social stagnation. This culture, which shapes the mentality of the Egyptian, is what aborts the will and effectiveness of man in favor of a paradoxical force that has sanctity and effectiveness. This requires a real and objective shift from a culture of words and stability to a culture of action and change, from a culture of the tongue to a culture of the hand and the tool. This is what will naturally move us to a culture of contradiction and movement as an existential condition, movement with contradiction, effectiveness between us and the other, egg, moving from a culture of exclusion that leads to discord and division, our historical condition, to a culture of contradiction or the coexistence of the two extremes, as the culture of intellectual and material movement is in controversy. A constant common thing that does not arise or exist except between two opposites, e us and the other, and the existence of each party depends on the existence of the other. This is why dialogue arose, which is a struggle within the framework of unity or a movement within the framework of contradiction. The picture is not complete and we do not understand it except in its dynamic connotations. That is, the existence of two opposites, otherwise it seems dead. Is life nothing but a movement between opposites? The above is completed by talking about what we have come to call the translation crisis in the Arab world. I have previously discussed this in detail in light of significant statistics, whether in my book Translation in the Arab World or in the United Nations Human Development Report 2003. 
The study confirms that translation is extremely low, and we called, as the Dean of Arabic Literature, Taha Hussein, previously called, for the establishment of an Arab institution for translation. But despite the attempts to rescue and cover the nakedness and the establishment of translation centers in a number of Arab countries, with the allocation of huge funds in the Gulf countries, they all confirm the dispersion of efforts without a clear, common, comprehensive strategic goal. This was also confirmed by the first Arab report on cultural development. The 2007 report made it clear that the political climate characterized by tyranny, oppression, and the absence of freedoms led to the revival of obscurantism and extremist Salafist fundamentalist thought. He pointed out that this climate is responsible for the Arab person's withdrawal from the culture of acquiring knowledge and interest in reading and research. My opinion is that the reality of the translation situation, far from formalities and blind numbers, is not a crisis, but rather a social-cultural stance towards knowledge, creativity and innovation coupled with societal effectiveness to produce self-existence. It is not right to talk about translation without talking about societal creative action and cognitive curiosity. Social action and thought are in a dialectical, evolutionary conjunction, and this is not present in our culture. The culture of exclusion and self-sufficiency and inheritance, and it is not right without talking about humans, changing reality with self-will and engaging as a positive active force in global action and thought. That is, engaging in modernity as a creative, self-integrated engagement in a phased development. I mean unity with the conflict in the modern world. This is a condition for a radical cultural change towards an Egyptian reality created by the Egyptian person. Now that I am over 90 years old, I look at life with a farewell look. I see that I miss the Egypt that was on my mind, and I see that Egypt, on the general human level, is sinking in an unprecedented way into the mire of the inherited absurdity. Egypt is no longer a society, but has become a residential complex, and I might add what my long-standing friend Anwar Abdul Malik added it to me, saying that it has become a residential community for uncontrolled instincts. I miss the Egypt of the dream and motivation, the Egypt of historically unified consciousness, the Egypt of homeland and citizenship, the Egypt of reality charged with the will to act, thought and collective movement, the Egypt of the future. I miss all of this and I see nothing but excessive age. And running after mirages. But beneath the ashes is the embers of a fire that may kindle and its flame intensify, and from among the rubble of chaos emerges hope, this is how history has taught us, and the waters of the Nile never turn back. Dedication To those who embrace freedom of thought, doubt, and disagreement as a legitimate human right while stepping on the path of research, renewal, and empowerment. Shaki Galil